Uh, I think we may get start. Uh, others can join in uh, uh, as we continue. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining this uh, uh, online event which is part of the London Festival of Architecture. Yeah, so I hope all of you can hear me properly. Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, this uh, event is part of the uh, London Festival of Architecture, which is uh, which is over the period one first to thirty June. So this event is only over a single day, where uh, we are covering the circular design principles for uh, a, a more sustainable building environment. Which, uh, as we've been seeing uh, over the course of uh, the uh, discussion, is a very important uh, element for circular economy. Okay, so the theme for the LFA uh, for this year, uh, actually it's been converted to digital because of, of a pandemic. So you can see here the, uh, the main theme has been power. So we are trying to uh, associate power to buildings and uh, there's a very nice description here. So uh, what the, the aim of this workshop is to see how we can combine power and circularity to create a genuinely sustainable environment. So if we can, of course, design buildings, we associate lots of importance to buildings, but if we can do that in a more responsible way, uh, using uh, uh, circular design principles that can even achieve better results. Okay, so just a few information on myself. So I'm Henry Gouchon, so I'm an academic at the University of Mauritius, and I'm part currently of a network uh, of the Ellen McCarthy Foundation, which is a circular uh, economy pioneers. So it's, an, it's a network of 10 countries in Africa, and we are trying to disseminate uh, circular design principles in our respective country. So some of our members could be actually part of the uh, event today. Okay, so I take this opportunity again to thank uh, the uh, we have Anna, Pauv, and Guti from the British Council uh, UK, and we have Anna from the uh, Ellen McCarthy Foundation. They have been uh, very instrumental in uh, allowing this workshop, and of course the whole campaign that uh, is running in the in the various countries. And then uh, we have Hafiza and Ashmita, uh, part of British Council in Mauritius. They are helping us a lot here to actually uh, make our events more impactful. And I also have Marin, who is a digital storyteller that's who's accompanying me on this uh, mission to disseminate circular design principles in Mauritius. So we have a huge pleasure to have Guy Donchu today amongst us, who's going to share his experience uh, in the field. He's, uh, he has a lot of experience, as you can see from his bio here. He has lots of experience in the field of architecture and in general uh, towards contribution for circular economy. So we'll have the huge privilege and honor to, uh, to hear from him later about his vision and what he thinks needs to be done to, uh, to further contribute no, no. to the circular economy. So uh, I can hear some background noise. Uh, can, can you mute, please? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, as we go along, we have the opportunity to listen to Guy Donsu, what are his vision and his ideas, how we can promote circular economy. Uh, in Mauritius, and of course, he has worked over the whole of Africa, so he would have a, a very good notion of how we can work together. Okay, so the whole presentation today uh, have been taken from these two references here. First, the circular design guide. So, if you are willing to learn more about circular design, the very nice resources. And based on this circular design guide here, circular economy in the built environment has been created by Arup. So, these two documents have been referenced in this. Uh, so if you look at a circular economy and you want to uh, learn more about it, you have three main pillars. That's uh, regenerate natural systems, design out waste and pollution, and keep products and materials in use. So these are three fundamental pillars of a circular economy. Now, based on that now, as we're seeing later, we can generate strategies uh, that, that helps uh, in the creation of circular Okay, so now, why do you need to move a circular economy? So very briefly, I hope most of you will be aware of that, if, uh, if, if you've read about circular economy. So currently, we are more, we're predominantly in a linear economy. We're just using uh, materials from the environment. We're using them. And then when we are finished, uh, they have met our needs in a way. We just throw them away. And so it's a linear approach here where we are not really valorizing materials in the proper way. And if we keep doing that, at some point in time, our natural resources will become depleted. And this is actually what's happening. So uh, on one side, we are facing issues with the, uh, uh, the very source of our natural resources. But on the other hand, since we're just throwing waste away, this is also causing an environmental hazard. But a more responsible way, I would say even more intelligent way would be to use these resources in a circular way. So not just uh, when, let's say that's at the end of the life cycle, we can continue to valorize it as much as possible. So this is what the linear economy is 
uh, is all about currently. Uh, you, have, you can see you have two cycles, the technical and the biological cycles. So we'll talk about that a bit more in detail later. So currently, like I've said, take, make use, and then dispose, that's a this linear economy. But so this is the outcome of a linear economy here where you're just throwing things out. So all these materials actually, uh, we are saying they're useless, but is it really useless? This is about uh, on the beaches here. So maybe we're having from Mauritius, where we have nice beaches. So we have to make sure we don't have a situation like this. And plastic, we know it's a big issue. So just a few diagrams to show us what are the uh, nefarious uh, uh, consequences of going for a, a linear economy. Now, if you now go up to do that shifting now and go for a circular economy. Now we can again see these two cycles, the technical cycle in blue and the biological cycle in green. Now we don't want this to be just a start and finish where we are producing waste. We want this to be a circular uh, process here where we are feeding materials in or reusing materials as we'll be seeing later. What are the uh, various means we can, uh, we can actually discuss later. So there's a bit more details here of the two cycles I've discussed before where the blue ones are, are the technical cycle here. So you have to go of uh, reuse, uh, refurbish, recycle. And then we also have a biological cycle, which uh, relates to how our environment works. We have lots of bi bi uh, biological mechanisms in place. So if we know how to use these two cycles properly, we can achieve, uh, we, can, we can go far in terms of recycling. As we've seen earlier, the linear cycle actually mingles these two uh, cycles in a way which is I would say uh, untraceable we don't know what we're doing and at the end we just throw away all the waste but if we can be a bit more intelligent and understand these two cycles properly we can achieve a lot so if you apply uh, these concepts of circular economy in the construction industry here uh, you can see here we start the design phase so we'll be talking a bit more on that later if we get this design phase right this is where we can actually uh, do uh, actually valorize and bring the, the best out of our product or service, be it a building or any other product, we have to get the design fits right because if you don't get it right here down the line, there may not be very optimum situation which we can use to, uh, to achieve a circular economy. Okay? So basically, if for the construction industry here, we have a design phase and then of course we have the uh, out of the design, we get the sourcing and then we construct. So all these phases we're talking here would involve materials, resources, so if we plan this beforehand in the design phase, then all these things are going to go very smoothly. But if we don't plan everything here intelligently and we do it in a sort of piecemeal way here, this is where we get sub-optimalities and in the, in, in the end, we won't be able to optimize the whole process. And I would say currently this is how the linear process is working. Okay? So you have a construction process and of course during operation as well, you have lots of uh, 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 steel materials being used and energy as well and water requirements and you also produce waste so this uh, issue with materials and resources are during the construction and the operation phase as well so it's very important that at the design phase itself you have already factored in your operation as well so you have to be able to predict in a way how your building or your built environment would behave and then uh, you can optimize it if you don't do that then down the line you can find occupants not not very happy with the interior environment or maybe buildings consuming lots of uh, energy or maybe uh, the water as well and you have runoff from the from the building and causing lots of issues so again i'm stressing on the, on the fact that all these things have to be factored in at the design phase yeah of course now uh, after you operated your building and you want to do some retrofits or you want to demolish it even these things would have implications of materials you're using and again if you don't consider these uh, uh, these aspects at the design phase here also you have issues. For example, if you don't choose materials which are recyclable or they have, they're not modular enough where you have to replace the whole system. So this is not going to optimize your circularity here. Okay. So a few terms I think we've discussed uh, uh, from the start. So circular economy is actually trying to decouple economic growth from resource consumption. So if we uh, don't do the circular uh, circularity in our economy, as we grow and we have more people and we want to have a higher standard of living, we'll end up consuming more resources and we know our resources are actually limited. So we need to find ways we can decouple economic growth from resource consumption. And the circular economy would achieve that. And I've highlighted here design here. So again, I'm stressing on that. We have to be make sure that uh, we factor all these aspects of the design phase itself. It becomes very difficult if we don't do it uh, at the start. Okay, so some uh, facts about our built environment here. Uh, these are studies in North America and Europe where we spend over 90% of our time indoors. 
And I think it will be very similar in Mauritius and maybe over whole Africa. We do spend lots of time in, in sand buildings. So it's very important, since we spend so much time, it's very important that our spaces are conceived, designed and developed according to our preferences to make sure people are comfortable. But I, as I scope, there's a term I've written down, there's no outside really. So uh, we tend to think, yes, let's say we are inside a building and to make us comfortable, we can do all means we can so that uh, we achieve comfortable uh, conditions inside and then we can not care for the environment or what's happening outside. But I think it's very important for us to realize there's no outside really because we are part of an ecosystem and if we don't respect or we harm the uh, exterior, like you're saying here, in the end it's going to hit us back. That's what's happening and so I think it's very important for us to realize that there's no actually in no outside as such. We are part of that ecosystem, it's very important for us to take care of it. So if you go a bit in, the, in, more, in more depth now, what's the built environment? So it's quite huge actually. We have buildings, we have infrastructure, transportation, energy, water, and waste. And fundamental to achieve circular economy is again to, uh, to, to consider design, planning, and construction, and to achieve high quality of built environment, which in turn will impact the human health, well-being, and productivity. Lots of studies have been carried out to show the close, the close correlation between the quality of our indoor environment and the well-being and productivity of people. Now, uh, if we don't do that, uh, we have negative externalities, which are going to hit us back again, like I've said. And already we are facing issues like climate change, like water, soil, noise, and air pollution. Yeah, so already we have, uh, we have negative externalities in, in the way we've developed, not just uh, because of built environment, but in general uh, over uh, other sectors as well. But we've seen the built environment has a, a huge uh, contribution in, in terms of resources and what so around the world, we've seen uh, many economies investing a lot in buildings and built environment because of that significant contribution it has for them. Okay. Now, when we're trying to quantify the impact of these externalities, it becomes very important for us, can we really measure the cost that uh, these externalities have on our natural capital? So this is not typically done, for example, if you pollute the air or if you are destroying the environment, you're cutting down forests. Uh, it's not easy for us because these things are tend to be freely available. We don't tend to put cost to them, but I would say maybe they are priceless. But because it's freely available, we don't tend to put cost to them. This is what has caused all this uh, issues with environment. Yeah. So some uh, some uh, uh, quotes that I received from uh, I've taken from the uh, circuit design guide. So first one is showing the huge. Uh, the, the huge business opportunity the circular economy represents. So because now it's a new way of uh, protecting the environment and going ahead, it's sort of a huge market share. So uh, if people want to get into a business enterprise or existing businesses themselves, they want to reinvent themselves, circular economy or circular design principles is a very good, uh, uh, a very good paradigm to go for. And the second one here is showing you the sheer, uh, the sheer amount of uh, share that the building industry has for uh, for the whole economy, it accounts for 50% of global steel and lots of materials are used. So again, like I was saying earlier, this is one of the main reasons why so much uh, importance is being attached to the sustainability agenda for the built environment. So I would say maybe all, all economies, all countries of, around the world would have in some way or another a, an agenda for the, uh, for the built industry. So uh, this is one quote from uh, Dr. Peter Witt. So uh, again, saying as we uh, as we go along and develop cities, so if any change that would have would need to be triggered by new demand, and the circular economy seems to be a, a very important pillar now for cities to reinvent themselves. Yeah. So at this point, I'm just giving a brief about uh, circular economy, and later I'm, just, I'm going to present some tools that are able to us for us to go a bit more in depth. So at this point, I would, uh, I would invite uh, Mr. Guy Monsieur to share with us his uh, perspectives and his vision and his experiences he had with the build environment and in, in the building projects and uh, show, uh, show us how, what's the barriers currently and what are the good things we're doing already and what are the opportunities in how we can. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kishan. Uh, before I start, I would like to share with you uh, a short story which happened to me in one of my trips in Africa. And that was a long time ago. I was in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to 
the market. This is something I like to do whenever I travel. I went to the food market, the public market. And I, that was 17 years ago. Eh? And I was really surprised to see there was one man, his job was to collect all waste you can imagine, plastic, cardboard, uh, paper, cans, any thinkable material he would collect and he will imagine the use that you can use, reuse it, how to transform it and then he sell it to the other people who transform it into electric fans from uh, oil jerry can, basket with cables of computer, uh, calculators with all phone uh, dial pads. You don't have this kind of phone anymore today. But nothing was thrown away. Nothing was wasted. I think all the gurus of zero waste in the world maybe should one day go to this uh, market and see how nothing is thrown away. And there was no awareness of zero waste or recycling in those days, especially in Africa. But for them, every piece of waste was a raw material for a new life. And so, and this is, I would say, not only in Addis Ababa, but all, almost everywhere in Africa, there's just a, a yogurt, a yogurt can, or I don't know how to say a box, it has a second life. And then after that, a third life or whatever. Everything is reused. And this leads me to, you know, in, in the approach to the issue of, of, of uh, zero waste or sustainability or now circular economy has always been the case. I did my studies of architecture in the 70s. Can you imagine? It's like 40 years. And yet there was already uh, this notion, and I remember I followed a, a, a lecture, a course, which was called Architecture Bioclimatic, mm -hmm. which means that you use climate to do what you cannot have the resources to do with, you know, water, energy, wind, all these, these, these sun, all these elements which are free of charge, and you in combine them into your building. In short, there was always this slogan or, or sentence, which was, less is more. Use less and do more with whatever less you're using. And this was the whole philosophy of everything. And this is what, but there was no need, no urgency. Oil was cheap, energy was cheap, everything was plentiful mm -hmm. and there was therefore no emergency in anything slowly people became aware of the necessity when the cost of everything got expensive in europe now they say we need to save etc but in africa it has always been recycling because they didn't have anything <laughs> and they had to do it and for them it's not a matter of awareness it's a matter of survival and this is how this approach in Africa, and I, now the whole world is like, we need to survive. And the last point is, with the COVID, with the confinement we have all experienced, we were forced into using a different, in, a, in an attitude that forces us to go into a new way of work, new way of eating, new way of living itself. You are forced to use technology. The technology was there for like 15 years. We never use it for payment, for shopping, for admin, for work. We don't even move because we, we can't move. So we had to do things differently. And by doing that, we have tested that it can work and it can be much more efficient. And the planet is very happy about it. I don't need to expand <laughs> on that. I'm sure you are all aware of it. So now, coming back to construction, which Kishan has just showed you and how we use it. In, in, he, I think he showed one slide which was very interesting. In Europe, because of the severe weather at some, depending on the season, I mean, in winter, it's very cold. You live inside and you have to protect yourself 
from the severe weather and, and cold weather in half of the year, I would say. Mm -hmm. Whereas in countries like us, tropical countries or African countries, uh, most of them equatorial, by the way, the tropical countries, for your information, represent more than half of the countries of the world. The, the tropical countries are 110 countries in the whole world. And these, we are no longer in or out. We like this sort of in-between. In fact, we don't protect ourselves from the outside. We are part of the outside and the inside. There is no barrier and no frontier. And this is a very important notion that leads us in the design what we do. So what we want is just the air to cross through the house so that through the place you are working or sleeping or whatever, so that you don't need any energy either for a fan or for an air conditioning to, to use. You, in fact, you are, you are using zero energy. If it's planned properly, you observe where the wind will come through and, and you plan your openings accordingly. You observe where the sun will be in the morning or in the afternoon or at noon during your activity, the time of it. And then you can provide shade where you are very comfortable. You can plant a tree where it's not about construction or architecture. You plant a tree and the tree gives you shade and you can plant it in a proper place in the proper direction and using all that. All the water that falls on your place, house, roof, can not only feed your rooftop garden, but also be recuperated for a, diff a, a series of, of, of uses which we always plan. You know, uh, we have this notion in rich countries that you use water only once. And then you, if you, wa you if we wash our dishes with potable water and then we throw it away. But the, instead of throwing it away, it could have maybe filtered a little bit and be used in the garden, be used for irrigation, be used for cleaning, washing a second time. And then, and it goes on like this. Everything so is reusable at a number of levels. And this is what the sort of circular uh, um, economy we, we could introduce in the way we do it. For, for, what, for the time being, just right now, we are doing a major project. Uh, we are doing a, a, an interesting project where we are using used containers, mm -hmm. all 20 feet and 40 feet containers, to do a whole project opening walls, adding openings, and, and combining them together, even ground floor, two-story floor, to do a whole project with used containers, which very often you can buy them cheap and they are thrown away and we are reusing them for a whole building. And this is a very interesting reuse of a form of circular economy, which we are trying to do in, in many places. I think, I think when, when we look at that and when we try to think that circular economy today is simply an attitude of reusing what we have, it's a principle that we can add to everything in life and of course construction in part of it and living in the city also is part of it. Now this is helped by something which is new, didn't exist before, is that the new technology with the, the, a simple smartphone, you can do so much. In fact, in Africa, M-Pesa is, is the main uh, way of paying. It's whole, completely cashless, no more cards, no more money, and you pay at a distance. And, 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 and this has changed completely the nature of relationship and the nature of, of, of um, shopping. And this is in Africa, by the way, just for your information, uh, I think only 20 or 25 percent of the African population have a bank account. So they can't even pay by in a different way. They either pay cash or pay by uh, mobile money. And mobile money is by far the most common way of it, much ahead than the rest of the world. 
in any way. So uh, uh, these are elements uh, which are maybe not very structured, what I've said, but are elements which we do in our everyday work uh, to be able to build and to be able to save energy, water, and all the, the, the important renewables that we think are, are to be, will be very scarce in the next future if we don't pay attention to, to, to the planet. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Guido, just one, uh, one maybe uh, contribution for you, from you. Uh, in terms of, uh, like we said earlier, we have lots of, uh, it, it, it represents a very big share of the economy. So uh, if you have young entrepreneurs trying to get into this uh, business with new ideas for the construction industry, for the built environment, how, could, how can they go about? Are there uh, areas they can look at for Africa and for, for Mauritius? I think they, they can focus on a specific area, whether uh, like, you know, uh, materials, mm -hmm. uh, different materials. I, I know of a lot of research in for Africa where uh, a lot of waste, which are just being thrown away, could be really recycled and reused. Some have already done that successfully, you know, like timber, uh, okay. timber decking, has been always using good wood, sometimes not even from renewable forests. They just use good timber. But nowadays with plastic, which we throw away, they can recycle plastic with wood, wood powder and make uh, timber planks. And then with these planks, you do everything. You do partitions, you do floor ceiling, you do walls, you do floors. And, and so there are so many things that can be done. This is just one element. Yeah. In, in, West Africa, they are using, you know, they have a, a traditional method of construction using uh, clay, uh, that is soil. Uh, yeah, bricks. Yeah. 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 I don't know English. And now they are reinforcing it with bubbles in plastic, you know, like a cling mm -hmm. film, you just put bubbles in them and, and, yeah. and then use that with uh, soil. And they are having reinforced walls with bubbles that is at the same time a solar insulator, a thermal mm -hmm. insulator for the mm -hmm. interiors. So yeah. and there are so many, you have to be innovative and I think think from the waste, like the Ethiopian man, mm -hmm. what can we do with this? Because everything has a lot of properties. You just have yeah. to think about it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Gaëtan. So uh, we'll, uh, the participants will have a chance to, uh, to uh, share the experiences and also ask questions to Gaëtan later if they have any specific uh, questions. So I'm just going to now present a few of the uh, tools we have for circular design in the built environment. So uh, I'm just going to share the screen. Okay, so uh, if you look at these circular design guides I've shown earlier, so uh, this is a summary, of course, I want to give you directions if you want to read more on that. Uh, if you apply the uh, three uh, pillars I mentioned earlier for circular economy, so there's a framework known as RESOLVE framework, which uh, is an acronym. So the R stands for Regenerate. So uh, here's just a summary of it. You can look in more details how actually this is applied in the, in the built environment and what opportunities you can have for uh, promoting the circular economy and based on that I'm sure if you take any of these uh, various points here you can actually derive business strategies in areas you are interested like Gaetan mentioned materials or services like here we are saying uh, later we'll see one approach here to virtualize so the V here stands for virtualize so if you virtualize an opportunity to offer services to uh, for customers without any uh, their need to actually buy the products yeah so for example, sharing is one of them here. We're saying one very good uh, pillar of the circular economy is to share so that we don't need to always build from scratch. For example, uh, one example which comes to mind is let's say in the community you have a school. So in the after hours here, you can use a school for other purposes. So maybe you don't need to construct a swimming pool or a gym. So these are strategies which can be used. Now optimizing the O here is uh, typically done the design phase, like I was stressing earlier. So if you can optimize your whole uh, building so you can predict how it works so you can do that at the design phase 
and the loop here is for the L, is for remanufacturing materials and recycling materials. So if you are at the end of a product life uh, of a product life cycle, you can't actually reuse it and it has to throw it away. So this is the last uh, strategy you have to use recycling. But before we go for recycling, there are inner loops, uh, which we'll see later, where it, it actually brings more value to your uh, to your product. Now, that's why I was mentioning the virtual as one. This is a very powerful uh, business opportunity now. Many businesses are going around this line to virtualize uh, as much as possible the services. So you don't need physical products and you don't need physical marketplaces to, uh, to uh, market your products. The last one is exchange. So here's a broad range, as you can see here on the right. So if you use renewable sources of energy, this is one way you can exchange your uh, sort of uh, grid electricity for more uh, clean energy. You can use alternative material inputs in your building, which is more environmental friendly. Again, uh, something to do with materials. Now, there are lots of uh, new technologies that came out uh, for energy buildings, be it air conditioning, big fans, being the way you do lighting. So all these things are a way to exchange, actually, if you have an existing building. It's worth going into uh, the newest technology and looking at ways you can, uh, you can uh, implement newer technology. Now, this is one uh, wasal I put here. Uh, Gaeton did speak a bit about that. Uh, he did speak about the outdoor indoor, but this is one, uh, just one, uh, uh, one uh, idea here is if you, if you just say sit under a tree uh, under normal conditions, you never feel uncomfortable. So why should it be different when you are inside our homes and offices? Uh, one issue if you're in Mauritius, uh, I, I'm sure it is similar in Africa, if you are inside a room which has not been well designed and you have lots of heat being uh, uh, amassed in the building structure during the day, then you have this heat which is radiated on you and this creates lots of discomfort, this is where you're going to go for air conditioning. But if you're sitting under a tree, you don't actually feel this phenomena of discomfort. So this, I think this is a very uh, a good analogy for us to uh, design our buildings. How can we replicate? Because one of the pillars of a circular economy is to regenerate natural systems. So if we could design the building to sort of replicate, because of course, bef before you actually built your, uh, you constructed the building, there was, uh, there was green spaces. And now when you actually uh, erected your building, then sort of uh, displacing this uh, green area. But if you want to bring back this green value, it's worth considering what was it before and how can you try to replicate that natural system inside the building. So in a way, of course, you need the building because there'll be uh, conditions like heavy rain or in cold countries there'll be snow where you need protection shelter. But in normal conditions, how can you replicate that same environment you would have uh, outside? So I think it's a very interesting perspective you can take, try to replicate that environment. Now, what, uh, what I'm going to show next are six strategies which you will come across in the circular design guide. Yeah, so these are the strategies which have been found to be very uh, effective by businesses. So what are we talking here about inner loops? So I'm going to come to this diagram again. This one here, we come earlier. So you can see recycling in the technical cycle, the last one. So this is the last uh, uh, opportunity you would typically uh, adopt because if you don't recycle, you're going to throw it away. But before you come to recycling, there were lots of inner loops like sharing, maintaining, reusing, refurbishing. So this is actually what you need to consider before we actually just recycle. Maybe one misconception we have is the circular economy is about using and recycling. That's not the case. There are lots of inner loops which we can consider to revalorize our products and materials and which can again bring forth a lot of business opportunities. Now, second one, we talk about it, the uh, virtualizing one is moving from products to services. So lots of companies have moved along this line and have been very successful. Okay. So you can, you can go for rental, for example. So a customer does not really need to buy the product from you. You can rent it. And so when the customer is done, you can take it back and you can better uh, take care of the product because you're the specialist. So one example which comes to mind here is if you read in this, in this feed is Philips. So Philips actually have gone into not selling lights, but they sell lighting. Yep. So uh, in, in airports around the world, big airports, big supermarkets, they actually install, maintain, and in, uh, when you have to take out the, the burnt uh, lights, they take care of all this. So they have uh, they have the whole responsibility, and this is where they can take much more care of the type of products they're putting in, and the energy efficiency, everything, and the disposal as well. So it's a very, I think it's a very powerful uh, uh, pillar of a circular economy is this moving from products to services. Not always possible, I, I knew that, but wherever possible, it's a very powerful uh, approach. 
that work life extension is to do with a choice of your materials and how you're designing it so that it is uh, actually durable. So that's very important in the choice of materials and the, the system you're designing. This can be achieved with a building or with any product. Okay, and uh, one example given here is even if something now is uh, is damaged, you can still make out something more valuable out of it. So if you've read about the kintsugi from Japanese art, where they use broken objects actually to weld it with gold, and it becomes even more valuable than it was before. So these are strategies for us to reduce waste, and hopefully, uh, I don't think possible to come to zero waste. Now, next one is safe and circular material choices. So at this stage, when you are choosing your materials itself, this is very critical. If you want to recycle your materials down the line, if you did not choose the proper materials at the start, you can't do it. And uh, I've written in blue here, local and regional materials are, are well suited. So this is uh, sort of a collaboration you could have maybe over with Madagascar, which is very close, or maybe over Africa, if we can, uh, maybe work in synergy with each one of them to try to find materials which are well suited for our climate because we use concrete currently, but uh, concrete basically in Mauritius is because of uh, cyclones. But if you look in terms of thermal comfort, not necessarily very good uh, because I'm a source of heat and then in the evening you're going to have all this retaliation quality on you. So uh, as much as possible, we have to go for local materials because we don't have the uh, embolic energy for transportation, that's fine. But if you can't find these materials locally, then it could be regional, but as close, of course, to Mauritius, that's the same. Now, uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, bigger projects, building projects, then we tend to go for uh, loss of material resources required in building projects. We've seen that earlier. Now, there's, one, there's a uh, increasing trend now to go for uh, materials that have uh, environmental uh, product declarations. Means in the product itself, if you're buying a fan or you're buying anything, furniture or flooring, so it's mentioned there what are the content inside it and how it was manufactured. So this is a very interesting uh, trend now. You find mostly in green building certification systems like Guyam, Lead, or Star. So if you choose materials that have environmental product uh, declarations or you have information about the chemistry, the material ingredients, the sourcing of raw materials, or if you carry out a life cycle assessment, means you are quantifying the impacts on the environment, you are rewarded for that. That's what the green building certification framework is about. So uh, this uh, sort of environmental product declarations are actually forcing the market now for us to have greener products. So again, this is a trend now, which is, I think, very, very favorable for the construction industry because it's going to try to phase out the products which are not environmental friendly or maybe force suppliers and manufacturers to go down this line and to look at the whole process and come up with more environmental friendly products. Yep. Dematerialization, we've talked about that. It's a virtualization part where you can offer uh, services or you can use digital platforms now as much as possible. Yep, so increasing trend in this respect of virtual marketplaces. You don't need to have a physical uh, environment, a physical space to uh, market your services. The sixth one, which is used a lot, is modularity. So if, let's say, in your building, you have lots of building systems, be it the architectural part or the civil part or the energy systems, so we know down the line we'll have to repair things, but how modular are your design or your products? So if it is modular, it means you don't need to throw away the whole thing. You can replace, you can replace the, the, the defective part and you can keep on using it. Okay, so I mentioned about this when you're looking at the resolve framework. So one example of modularity here would be use of renewable energy. So you have the option to go for renewable energy or grid. And so this provides sort of a flexibility in, in, in your building. Now, uh, if you want to go uh, and, and look at your whole building project now and break it down into subsystems. So again, in the uh, guide I've shown earlier, there's a very effective uh, model called the 7S model, which starts at a very high level here. We're talking about system here, means how your building is situated in its environment, what type of facilities you have already. Do you have water connection? Do you have electrical distribution? But if you don't have these things, then it's going to be, you have to bring this into site, so it's an additional effort. You start at the system level, then you come on your site, characteristics, then you come to structure, and next the skin. The skin is a very important element, of course, of your building. This is what regulates your interior environment. So the design of the skin is very important. And once you do that, the next level down is services. So your pipes, all your m &E parts. So this also have to be coordinated. Then the next step down is the space you are providing for the occupant. So this has to be designed accord in accordance to his needs. And finally, of course, you have equipment. So it's a 7S, which I think encapsulates very well all the elements of your building project. 
And it's a very systematic way for you to go across each of them and to look at the material requirements and how they relate with each other. And if you do that in a systematic way, like you said, at the design phase, you all do a good job. And if you optimize that, you do an iterative loop and to look at the performance of each one of them, whatever materials you're using. So I think it's a very nice framework for you to use. So more details are given in the guidelines I showed you earlier for the built environment. Now, just a few more elements I would like to present to you. Uh, if you look at the whole uh, project uh, process, a building project, so you would have lots of professionals who have to work together. You have many people, you have the landscape architect, the quantity surveyor, the architect, and of course, the people who are going to operate the building, like facility managers, the owner himself. So it's very important uh, that, so this is a whole project team. Now, there's one term used, uh, if you look in the, in the field of green building design, it's called integrative design. So again, the word design is there, and if all these people are actually working together in a coordinated way, one of the start of the project, have a very good chance of achieving circular design or a green building design. But I would say, by and large, currently, unfortunately, this is not happening. So each of these persons are going to work sort of isolated. Uh, so each one would work in their own field and then bring back a solution. But if you want to achieve proper circular design or proper green building design, you would have to have these people work together and feed back their designs with each other. Like uh, Gaeta was saying initially, if you want to uh, optimize, let's say, ventilation or lighting, delighting, maybe the architect would need to work with the ventilation designer or with the uh, HVAC engineer and so on. So this, I think, is a very critical element that we need to take care of if ever we want to uh, promote circular design. For example, the, the general contractor can advise because he has exper ex expertise and experience in the, uh, in, in, the, in the market for products. He can have ideas, how can we actually uh, procure materials which are environmental friendly and he can do that part. And similarly, the landscape architect can advise on plants that can be used around the building, what types of plants, like again, Gaito was saying. So if we do that in isolation, we won't achieve the optimum results we want. And I think this is one area we have to, uh, look into, I, I think across Africa, or even in Mauritius, we need to promote, we need to have this coordinated effort. Now this zooming in, zooming out, is also a very common term in circular design, means you come, you zoom into the uh, requirements of your owner, that's fine, but then you zoom out as well to see what impact your design choices is having on the environment. So you have to do this zooming in, zooming out many times. It's not just a question now of meeting the owner's requirements, you have to also look at the impacts you're having on environment or on material resources and so on. So this is sort of a new methodology of circular economy. Just one example, because I work in the field of building energy optimization. So this is typically what we do when you want to optimize uh, building energy. So you would start basically here with the uh, building orientation layout, then you get to get architectural openings, and then what impact your glazing and fabric are having, and then your MNE, your building system parts, and then you got efficiency of your uh, whole building and what kind of system controls can you implement to improve energy? It is only then that you are going to go for PV or a wind turbine. You can't feed a building which is not efficient using uh, renewable energy sources. And so PV panels or wind turbines become huge and it's not going to be cost effective. So I've, uh, this is a typical uh, energy optimization process, which of course you have energy simulation software that allows you to do that. So it's quite specialist, I would say, but we do have these tools now which allows us to do that prediction. This is one very interesting uh, uh, tool that we can have for the built environment. The second one is BIM. So I'm sure uh, you have heard of that. So BIM is BIM Link Information Modeling. It's a platform where different stakeholders, different uh, members of a building uh, of, of, of the team can actually interact and share information and not just doing design, but when you're constructing as well, it's very useful because you can update your, uh, your BIM. And doing operation as well now, you can have information on your BIM model to show uh, how your building is operating. You can put sensors now, you have IoT sensors, which can be used to collect information about the health of your building. So I think BIM, BIM is going to be a very interesting user platform for uh, promoting sustainability in the built environment or circular. Yep. So to conclude, I would say uh, there are certain elements that we have in the circular economy, which is a bit technical, which can be complicated. But I think it makes very good sense in intents and goals. It means it's very clear if you talk to a layman, a person who's not really in the field of uh, architecture or who's not uh, uh, knowledgeable of circular design. But when we speak about the intent of what we're trying to do, it makes sense to everyone, I would say. 
Yep, and we have an increasingly environmental conscious customer base now with land importance to uh, green products, environmental friendly products. So this is a very important market lever for us. Yep. And uh, like we said, huge potential for businesses now because the circular economy is becoming more and more important. So if we have design ideas which actually support the circular uh, principles, we have a good chance of actually being successful. But I think as professionals, because this tend to be complicated sometimes, I think I would say it's I won't say our responsibility, but it would be uh, very great if professionals can simplify complicated routines and procedures to very easy guidelines. Let's say if I take an example of myself, I'm, we are trying to work out on sustainable homes, for example. So we're carrying out simulations, we're carrying out all the analyses to uh, propose guidelines for people to make their, their, their homes more sustainable in very simple ways. So it's like we do the background work and then we produce very uh, user-friendly guidelines people can apply easily. Yeah? So uh, if we do that, I think we'll be able to achieve a lot in the, in the process of transforming our economy to a circular one. Okay, so I thank you all very much for, uh, for uh, being present in this uh, digital event. So I'd be very happy to hear from you if you have any experiences you want to share or good practices or any insight. And uh, if you have any questions for myself or for Gaito, we are very happy to hear. So you can just unmute and you can speak out. Thank you. So we have one question from Betty. So uh, I'm just going to read out. How will circular economy make affordable housing a reality in most African cities? Skyton, you have anything to uh, share on that? So I will repeat that. How will circular economy make affordable housing a reality in yeah. most African cities? Yeah, I mean, um, um, there, the, the, there is not one answer to that because mm -hmm. uh, um each african country is is africa is a continent and 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 it, the the materials you have in one country and and in in another country are very different the way the people live are very different also and the climate also are very mm -hmm. different in but there there are simple principles i think that that would help uh, in the circular economy and, and housing, affordable housing, is uh, when in most of these countries, it's about self-construction. People just collect what they can, mm -hmm. uh, what is available to build their own house and they use it uh, as a means of, they don't even have a savings account. Their saving account is like buying a few bricks or a piece of plank and then saving it until you have enough to be able to build a wall, mm -hmm. a room, a roof, etc. Yeah. I think by education, by sensitizing the people and awareness, there could be uh, uh, some form of training that will help them then to design the proper materials, which will use less, less uh, raw materials to uh, build up components which are simple and reusable that they can build with but we need to give them also uh, a plan how to use less yeah. materials to do that so it's quite complicated to 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 give like one size doesn't fit all and in in many countries this would be different materials different different types of living etc but otherwise um, uh, and, and, and second, there is a, a difference between living in the city or living in the uh, rural areas, which is a totally different story. Uh, yeah. uh, I think it's, it, in five minutes, it is the best answer I can give okay. you. It's, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, we have one uh, question from Michael. So where really is Mauritius in the implementation of the UN SDGs, especially 11 and 12? So 11 is sustainable cities and 12, SDG 12 is responsible consumption. Yep. Well, I, I'm, I'll, I'll try my best to, yeah. to, 
uh, Zaya would, uh, unfortunately, he had to leave, but yeah. Zaya would be the best person to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. I can answer for, for number 11, because yeah. number Sustainable seven, cities, yeah. Yeah, yeah is, is more. There is, you know, in, 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 in Mauritius, now there is a quite a, an awareness, although we don't have the legal framework to ensure that everything happens, but there is a strong awareness, especially among the younger generation. A strong awareness, at least in the consumption of energy, renewables, water, and how to save it and how to optimize its use. This is fairly well done. In transport, we are quite bad and far away from it. Too many cars, not enough good public transport, but the, the metro, the new tram we have, is helping a lot to reduce the influx. And what was also good now in the COVID, we learned not to be mobile, but to be mobile with uh, IT, with IT, so that we, instead of moving people or goods, you can really uh, do work or, or do a number of administrative tasks from a distance. And this saves energy and saves on the, on the whole transportation uh, system. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we can go on to say also we have we are learning now in 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 SDG 11 how to have how to use space and time in a different way. We have had always like in many countries also the attitude that we need to build. If we need a school, we build a school. If we need an office, we build an office. We use a house and then we build a house. We don't combine these same place. To, to be multi-purpose so that the same place can be reused at different times to ensure uh, less consumption and an optimization of resources. Mm -hmm. This, the, we, we are a, in a long way from that. Like when I take a, just a school, the first example, the school have sports ground, sports facilities, library, classroom that can become meeting rooms after hours, all these could be reused properly, but it's a question of management and a question of control, etc., which still needs a long way before we manage to do all this. There are so many ways we can improve on what we are doing now, but I think little by little, whether in building cities, in our public transportation, in the way we build it, and the use we make of out of it, will we'll really change the way we look at everything tomorrow. But I think we are only like halfway through. Okay. Thank you very much, Gaëtan. So uh, Hafiza has one question. So Hafiza, can you just unmute and ask? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Kishen. Hi, Gaëtan. Thank you so much for uh, this very insightful presentation. And I think it's a conversation that really needs to be happening on a, on a wider scale. But mm -hmm. I'm really happy. Um, you know, that the conversation has been sparked through uh, presentations like these. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is to both of you, um, Mahendra, uh, well, Kish, also yeah, knows Kishan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from, from, a, from an academic perspective, um, yeah. and Gaitan, I think, from the perspective, especially for, with the scope of your expertise uh, in Mauritius and uh, having worked so closely with African countries as well, uh, my question would be, um, so it, it was partly answered in your response uh, to Michael's question. Um, with, with these conversations that, that are happening, these circular design principles that we are learning about and conversations that we are having, um, it's, it's all fantastic and it's all brilliant. But then what is it that you guys would hope to see? What is it that really needs to happen to spark the change? So more specifically then, what would you, if there's one thing that you think could really spark change on a national level, so speaking for Mauritius then, what is it that, what is it that you think that could be, that thing that could spark the change? So for example, Gaetan, you spoke about how uh, COVID and the lockdown forced us to live differently, mm -hmm. uh, changing our eating habits, et cetera. So for us to live sustainably, to build sustainably, what would have to change? What, what would that spark be? I thought you want to go Thank first. 
Okay, I'll, I'll go first. I think the first, the, I would, my answer would be twofold. I think yeah. the first thing is the way we live, our mode, our everyday life. This has to change. This, mm -hmm. If we change this, then we change everything. Like, I give you an example. In my office, we have stopped going to work every day. Mm -hmm. We are now in a free, free week, a day only. The rest is work at home. Mm -hmm. And we have structured the whole thing totally differently. We are so used to work by Zoom every day and to hold meetings and to exchange by mail, WhatsApp, etc. It has changed completely. Just a simple thing like that, it means 40% of transport every week less for us. And the time saving is phenomenal and the efficiency has improved. So it's the mode of life. The second I would really invest a lot in is to create awareness in the younger generation. Not mm -hmm. that they are not aware already, mm -hmm. but to tell them how this awareness can be transformed in everyday life and then transform in everything they do at school, at home, in their leisure time, during the weekend, every single thing that they don't throw this, they close the tap, the, Every mm -hmm. single uh, moment of their life is part of the whole spirit. This, for me, these are the main two things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Gaetan. Uh, one point I would add is, uh, if you look at the first slide I, I mentioned, I, I started a campaign called Leave No Atom Wasted. So uh, I would say, uh, when I proposed the, uh, the campaign from Mauritius to the British Council and the Ellen Marcotte Foundation, I chose this to uh, sort of have a change in mindset uh, so that people become more uh, responsible and more aware of how they're using materials and resources. So I think this awareness and uh, knowing what we're doing with our materials and looking for opportunities, not just to throw things out, like I mentioned during the presentation, not to think that there's an outside and we can throw things outside and we are safe inside. So I think if we take this mindset up and we start caring for how we're using materials and going forward, I think we, we achieve a lot. So out of this, we start getting new ideas and maybe it can be a commercial idea, but it could be just a simple idea in a change in mindset, in a change of behavior and how we are dealing with our everyday products. Thanks, Kishan. Thanks, Gaitan. I made some comments in the chat box. Yeah. Um, I think that was really helpful. I think with everything that's already happening in the world, um, global warming and everything, you name it, I think, yeah. you know, it just still feels as if people... Uh, not everyone, obviously, I don't want to make generalizations, mm -hmm. but it does mm -hmm. feel that there isn't a sense of urgency in a situation where there should be. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've, uh, yeah, I really hear all of your points and um, I think definitely food for thought and yeah. I think definitely initiatives because really what we're trying to do is affect change as well yeah. and new ways of thinking and looking. I love what Gaitan said about how uh, that person in Addis Ababa mm -hmm. uh, sees every, every item, every piece of waste as a raw material for new life. And yeah. I think that is the mindset really that we need to be adopting here. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much for that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ha. Yeah. Any more, answer, any more comments or uh, insights from the participants? If not, then uh, I would thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, so I'm closing up the meeting. So we'll be sharing this video uh, online. If you have colleagues who would want to learn a bit more and look at the video, do share it, okay? So thank you very much, all of you, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Gaetan, Kishan. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, Kishan, are you still there? Yes, yes. Yeah, just to, uh, to in response to Michael's question. Yes, yes, I'm trying maybe to, you could share, to Yeah. Yeah, maybe we could share the face, your Facebook uh, link page. Yes, yes. Uh, to Michael, the design group. Michael, you're still there. Can we just uh, talk about it if you want?